So we've got this project that I've uh, run in three places, browser, emulator, real device. What's next from our workflow number one is we're still setting up this template. Here's the last thing we need to do with this, with this document. Um, our whole project exists in this folder, F apps template. So if, if you DIR to check, there's a file in there, config.xml. We need to edit that, and we're going to edit it with good old Notepad++. But uh, I don't believe we can type the command edit Notepad or something. We're going to open your, your plain old, you know, you, you open a plain old Explorer window. Go back to the safety of Windows here, and then open a computer. I'm on my flash drive, F drive, there it is, Kingston 8 gig. I'm going to double click to open my flash drive, your flash drive, or wherever you saved your project, desktop, or wherever yours ended up. And there's, oh, there's that apps folder that I created through the command prompt, make directory, remember. So you open up the apps folder. There's the template project that I created via Cordova create template. So I open that up. And this window here, then, obviously, is a representation of what I'm seeing in the command prompt. www folder, hooks folder, config, file, platforms, plugins, www plugins, platform, hooks, config. And I, now I want to edit the config file with Notepad++, so remember we can right-click HTML files, JavaScript files, basically all code files. We didn't work with XML files last month, but we'll work with them a little bit this month, specifically the config file. So you want to right-click config.xml, edit with Notepad++, and we'll get back to that code editor that we used all last month that we will continue to use this month. Because even though we've spent these two and a half days in doing command prompt stuff, we're still going to edit our, our main code here. That's not going to change. Um, so this is familiar, Notepad++. My handout here says we're going to change a few things. Um, line 2 starts off with the tag widget and then ends with slash widget. So as I said last time, XML is sort of like inventing your own tags and then those tags are translated to do something with the software. In this case, the Cordova team invented basically the widget tag, the description tag, the author tag, etc. And it does something because of Cordova. And so what we're going to do then is edit a few things here. Widget, there's ID. When we type Cordova create, remember we typed this. So if you mistyped it, when you did Cordova create in the command prompt, you can fix it here. Mine is fine. Version. This creates 0.01 .01 of the project. And version numbers are totally arbitrary. You can make them up however you want. They really don't have any meaning. But just version numbers are important for you to, to figure out the latest version of your project. In my notes here, this is actually more of a suggestion. I'm saying let's rename our version number to be something like this 1.20151007 what's that about the date we can use the date as a version number that's totally fine so that's what we'll do here on our version number in the quotes i'm going to remove 0 .0 0.0.1 .0 and we'll do 1.2015.10.13 that's an acceptable version number and the, the idea behind this version number is that big number right there will be my main version number. Right now we're working on version 1 of this project. When we get to the end of the, day, the, end of the month, we're going to release this to the world, version 1. Then if we need to do updates next month, I can change this to be version 2, 11.01. You see the logic behind that. It's version 2 of our main project. But we could have individual smaller updates in between that, not a whole version 2, because version 2 I might save to add brand new features, brand new interface, 
you know, that warrants a big version number change. But between now and the end of the month, I might do a lot of little tweaks. Then I might change version to keep it on 1, but then do 20, 15, 10, 15. So you see the logic there. These smaller versions that I'm updating, I'm changing the date part of the version. But the, the big value, 1 dot whatever, that's the one that changes with big updates to the project. Did you create a new file when you create when you change the version? Nope. It's, it's all in the same config XML file and it's all within the same project template. What we need to do is add, so next line here, after our version number, then we need to add something specific for Android. Android, Google, and Amazon are going to check, does your Android app have this? If it doesn't, your app will not be accepted. So we're going to add Android dash version code equals 1. And I'll explain it in a moment. Let's write it right after version. So this is still on line 2, space, um, Android dash version code, capital C, equals quote, end quote. So you have to type it this way. Code is a capital C, but the rest is lowercase. What this is, is just going to be a whole number that will always increment. We start on 1. This is our first version of our app. If we upload a brand new, if we, if we finish this course, part 3, and we uploaded our project to Google Play or Amazon, it's going to look, this is version 1. Then let's say we update our code in any way possible. We update our, our project and we want to upload it again to Amazon or Google. It will need to then be version 2. Then we upload a brand new version next month, in two months. That needs to be in, then be the next number. These are whole numbers. It has to be 1, 2, 3, 4. So every time you upload a new version of your project to the app stores, you need to increment that number. Technically, you don't need to increment this number. This number is almost unimportant. What needs to be important and needs to be updated on a regular basis when you upload your project is the Android version code and it's always whole numbers. So let's say it's next month, the 30th of next month, and I'm, and I'm uploading the third version of my project. This is totally acceptable. It's the third version of my app according to the app stores, and I'm still on version 1 here because I haven't made a huge update. Here I missed, I, I made three updates that included, you know, like spelling errors and that icon needed a, a drop shadow, stuff like that. So version is pretty much arbitrary, but version code needs to be accurate. So that's going to be 1, our first version. Add your own description on line 5. Okay, line 5. Description slash description tags. This is a sample Apache Cordova app that responds to the device ready event. Okay, you can change that to whatever you want, but I'm going to write here Cordova template project. That's what this is, literally. It's my template project for Cordova. You can write anything you want. Line 7 and 8 should also be updated to something that makes sense for you. Line 7, author tag with a few attributes. Email, href. So put in your email address or make it up if you want. This is dev.cordova.apache.org. You can put anything you want here. Maybe a real address. Maybe not. Doesn't matter. href. Your website. If you don't have a website, you can make it up. Or we'll leave this one here, but this is going to cordova.io. Victor.com. Why not? Now to be a little consistent, perhaps. Widget ID is com.jones.template. Some of these things are arbitrary. I could have here email at jones.com and my address, jones.com. 
We don't need to be the same thing, but you need to think about in terms. You're an app developer now. You may not feel like it, but you're an app developer. And so thinking like one, you can make up your own company right now, right here. Apache Cordova team? Oh, this is Victor Apps, LLC. Anything you want here. For author, href, email, and your company name. Okay, uh, whatever changes you've made, just to make sure, save them at this point. Okay, so then we've got these different directives. Content tag, which is self-closing. Notice how uh, it opens and closes itself. There's no pair. And this is content, source equals index HTML. This is what makes your index file from last month open up as the app. If we had a brand new index-v2, then right here we're telling the device when you load our project, open index v2. So whatever we want to put there, but we'll leave it as index because that's usually what makes sense. That's usually what's set up. Uh, plug-in whitelist, don't worry about that just yet, but this allows these features of a whitelist. Again, don't worry about it. Access origin, everything, don't worry about it. It just means be fully functional, basically. Allow intent. These are the different protocols that our app could access. Uh, we, we have this app and we'll be able to do stuff such as also loading up websites from the internet. So we'll be able to load internet addresses. We'll be able to load secure internet addresses. We'll be able to launch phone numbers. So if our app has a phone number and we write the right code, we can tap that phone number and it'll launch your, your phone dialer. So we have the telephone protocol. We also have SMS, text messages. We have the mail to protocol, so we can send emails. And the geo protocol, which is to access geolocation features. So that's all default stuff, that's good. Then we've got platform-specific stuff. <coughs> specific for Android, specific for iOS. Allow intent href market, the market protocol, which basically means if your app has a link to the Google Play Store and someone taps it, it will open in the Google Play app. Same thing as if you were loading up this project in an iPhone and someone tapped the link to open up the iTunes Music Store, it would open the iTunes Music Store. So if it still doesn't quite make sense, don't worry. These are the defaults. They all work just fine. But we need to add a few more things to make our app template what we want it to be. So I say here, before platform name Android, add this line. Um, for some reason, I, I don't think you can copy and paste from this PDF. So we'll have to type it manually. Make sure you type it correctly. So I'm going to say above line 19. Give yourself a brand new line 19. And we will type open and close angle brackets, but since this is a self-closing tag, it doesn't have a pair. I'm going to type it angle bracket, angle bracket, slash. Because that's what we've got here. Angle bracket, stuff, slash, angle bracket. That's what I'm going to need here. So angle bracket, stuff, slash, angle bracket, like the other ones. And we need a brand new tag, which is preference, pre preference, preference, space, preference, name equals, quotes, Orientation, capital O, that's important. We're saying here, we're going to affect the orientation preference. 
Because right now, if you loaded up your project on your real device especially, you, you're going to hold it like this, you can look at it nice, and then you go landscape, and it shifts landscape. It goes vertical, it goes portrait. It goes landscape, it goes portrait. So cool, I might want it... Oh, you guys should have told me I wasn't shifting, because I have it locked. There we go. Here we go. Landscape, right? Portrait. Yes. So um, it, uh, it has that ability to go landscape built in. Maybe my app, I don't want it to go landscape. I want it to always be portrait. Do you ever use your device and you're reading something, you're laying down, and as you tilt your head, then everything tilts. You don't want that, maybe. So I want my app to always be vertical, even if you go horizontal. So that's what this preference is about. Let's change the orientation. So then further, value... quotes. We have a few ones built in, which we can look up, of course, but the one we want is portrait. This will lock the orientation of my app to always be portrait. What if you want it to be both? Don't put anything. If you don't put anything, don't even put this line here. If you want both, don't put that line. Right here, we're just locking it in. I think you can put in auto here to do that, but you might as well leave it out because it'll already do it. And then if we want it only landscape, then we can do landscape. We have a few other options. I have to look them up. But you, you can decide what you want here. And for our particular app, I want it to always be vertical because that's how I designed my project. My portfolio portrait. Then we're going to add another one here, another preference with another name and another value. So next line, line 20. Preference. Another preference. Another name, another value. Name equals... Value equals... This is the uh, this is the standard uh, syntax for these features of our project. There's often some tag with some attributes. So preference, name attribute, value attribute. In this particular attribute is one called uh, disallow overscroll. Notice capital letters. So the name here is disallow overscroll. What this will do. Do you ever visit websites and you're scrolling up and then eventually you get to the end of the website and you try to scroll a little bit more and you get some sort of feedback, maybe a little glow or maybe some something that tells you you're at the end. That's the over scroll. A regular website, if you go too far, it's going to, depending on your device, on one device mine glows at the bottom to tell me you're, you're going too far, there's nothing there. On this device, there's like a bulge that appears when I try to go too far. It's telling you there's nothing there. There's no more, no more you can keep scrolling. Well, that's the mark of a website. And you don't see that often on a real app. You just end. You get to the end of the screen. So we're saying let's do that. Let's take away that, that feedback, that overscroll feedback. We disallow overscroll. Uh, true value true. So now it's not going to look like you can keep scrolling. It's just going to stop. It'll be very subtle. You might not notice it. So what I would do is remove it. Now that I'm telling you what it is, you can remove it, see what it looks like, put it back in, see what it looks like. You'll see that you're, you'll get that what I'm, which I'm talking about. Next we need to add some Android specific code. So inside the platform name Android tag, so inside here, doesn't matter where, but I'll add it right after line 22. We're going to add some of these preferences that only apply to Android. In the preference, again, preference, name, value. Okay. So same sort of syntax. Preference, 
name equals value equals. Here we need to say, uh, remember last week when we were in, in Android Studio and we created a brand new project and it asked us, what is the minimum version of Android that we want to use? What are we going to support? Are we going to support people with an Android 2.0 device or people with an Android 4 device? That's what we need to say here. What version of Android are we going to support? So on my handout, we've then got Android dash min SDK version. This is the minimum version of Android that we're going to use, and the value will be 10. So we've got Android 4 and 6 and 3.3 .3 and all of that, but another name for that is this whole number, which this is what I was saying, it's confusing. There's the code number of Android, there's the API version of Android, and then there's the, you know, the, the consumer version number. So we're going to put um, number 10. So uh, Android dash min SDK version. Notice the capital letters. It's basically a capital letter on the second word. Value 10. So let's say we have the uh, version 6 right now, right? So it's going to go down. No, that's the confusing thing. Version 6 is actually version 24. Is it API? Or? It's API. Oh. This is the API value. Okay. So then we would have to look up what does is, what is 10 translate to? I think it's like 2.8, something like that. So this is the API value, not the whole number, the, the one for consumers. And then after that, uh, we've got preference name Android Target SDK version 14. So um, next line, preference <coughs> name value <coughs> target SDK version. <coughs> Android target SDK version 14. Now, as um, <coughs> like I said, I thought I have, I thought I put into the folder. I'm going to need to triple check it, but I thought I put in the latest version of my handouts because this is something that I also changed on one. Um, this is saying the minimum is 10, but we're shooting for 14. Uh, let's actually put both of them to 14. <coughs> Let's put both of them to 14 um, because in my testing, I think I remember that 10 gave a little problem. So uh, you can make you can make a note on the notes here, but I'm gonna double check that it should be 14. Okay, I'm gonna save that. We shouldn't type the word save. Don't type the word save. So our workflow is we're going to be making changes in uh, Notepad++. We're going to save our work, but we're no longer going to go up to run Firefox or run Chrome. It's no longer a website. It's, it's an Android project. So our workflow is we're going to make changes in Notepad, and then we're going to go back to Command Prompt, and then you're going to do either Cordova Run Browser or Cordova Run Android or Cordova Emulate Android. We're going to do one of those three. Run Browser obviously loads the web browser but it's not the same as doing run browser in Notepad. Um, emulate Android obviously loads the virtual device, and run Android loads it on the real device. So I'm going to load it on my real device, because as I saw, this still rotates, right? I just added the code to stop rotating, so I'm going to confirm that. Cordova run Android.
So when this finishes building and then it deploys to my device, it's going to look at all of these updates and update or upload the latest version of the app. It's, it's going to take a little longer than our, than our workflow from last month because we could simply save, run Firefox. Now we need to wait for this to compile and then to be put on our device. So it's coming, installing app on device. Okay, it's launching it. It's coming on my device here. Device is ready. Rotate. Did it rotate? Nope. Because it followed my command. Orientation portrait. So it gets stuck on portrait, even if I go horizontal. I don't really see the over scroll now because now I've turned it off. And then that Android Min SDK version and such um, doesn't, uh, doesn't do anything either. Uh, it doesn't do anything visually. What I'm going to do is Android or Cordova emulate Android, so you can see it on my device, on my screen. And I can also deploy it here. We can also rotate our device. Our, if you've got a virtual device, you can rotate this. I'll show you how in a moment. Um, so this is going to load up on my virtual device right there. If you want to rotate your virtual device, you have to press on the number pad, not the number row up here, the number pad. Press 9, and it rotates, and press 7. And it rotates back. Seven and nine rotate. If yours is not doing it, turn off numlock. It's landscape. It's landscape and it's still portrait mode because we've locked it into place. If we didn't have that, then it wouldn't work properly. So make sure your project works, that these edits worked. <coughs> Or if it, if it 
Wasn't working. This would rotate. Mm -hmm. Maybe we just needed to wait a little longer. Maybe, maybe it had not. It might. Have, it was probably still on the old one, and then it finished. And it finished in this part, and then now it launched the new version. All right, so um, my number 10 right there then just tells you, okay, you've made all of these changes, and you can emulate, you can run browser, you can run Android, so everything is, is written right there. So that's the end of my uh, workflow number one. Let's look at the n instruction number six, uh, code of workflow number two. So I need to go back to my PDFs. So in this part of the workflow, what I talk about here is we were able to remember when we when we had the the 
last month we we were in in Firefox for example and we had F12 we had the developer tools to help us debug various aspects of the project so remember this developer thing here we have that to some extent still if you do this via Cordova emulate um, Cordova run browser you still have the ability to press F12 in the web browser and that'll bring up that uh, developers console and that's going to be useful to look at remember we do console.log output and what about errors and so forth so if you press F12 if you do Cordova run browser and you bring it up in the web browser and have your device this here it's going to look familiar but different because this is Chrome instead of Firefox and the console we've got elements, network, sources. If you don't see console, it's probably hidden next to these double arrows. Console. So we have this console in, in Chrome. So it tells me a couple of things are perhaps errors and such, but don't worry. We've got this console. But the, the browser is still not the best way to test your project. A device is the best way. The device is going to be the purest way to test, does my project work? Does vibration work? Does geolocation, accelerometer, all that stuff. We're not going to be able to test some of those things very accurately in the browser. So we have something that will let us use this console output, and that's what my instructions are saying right here. You will see how to monitor our app with the Android SDK tools. So I'm going to go over to, it's telling me, go to your C drive. So you're going to open a, in, you're going to open an Explorer window, a regular Windows window, and you're going to go to the C drive, into the Android SDK folder, into the tools folder. So here it is, local disk C, Android SDK, tools. And one of these little apps is called monitor.bat. Monitor. So when you find monitor, double click it in the tools folder. I think when you when you first turn on monitor at home it may pop up and ask you if you would like to send statistics to Google about your usage. Uh, on these labs I canceled that, but on your own home computer if it asks you, you can click yes or no. And what this does then, it brings us this Android device monitor. There's a lot of little screens to look at, but we're really only going to pay attention to one or two got these tabs all over the place. One of the important tabs at the top left is devices. Mine says you've got your Motorola E running and your virtual device running. Hopefully yours says something similar. Virtual device at least, or maybe whatever your device is, right there. So the monitor sees two running devices. And then at the bottom you see something called LogCat. Log catalog. This is like the console that we had in the web browser, but much more powerful because it's going to tell you everything that your device is doing. For example, if I click on my Motorola device, if I click on it once, it's going to give me feedback of what my device is doing, even though I'm not touching it, even though it's in sleep mode, even though I'm not doing anything, it's doing stuff behind the scenes, always. So your phone right now in your pocket is doing stuff behind the scenes. This is what it's doing behind the scenes. It might be connecting to the cell tower. It might be um, checking its battery status. And because you're plugged in, it's constantly charging. So look at that. All of this time here, stuff is going on. Wi-Fi. It's checking that the Wi-Fi is on. All that stuff's going on in the background. 
My virtual device is a little more quiet because it's not a full kind of device, but it still is going to say a bunch of things. Something about uh, skip some frames and resuming broadcast and window has focus. Well, if you look, my Motorola is also currently running my template project, com.jones.template. And my virtual device is also running it, as well as other things. So yours may show more or less than mine, but I'm just educating you that this screen will show you your running devices, console output. What I want to do is, this is zooming by with a lot of info. I only want it to show me my console output for my, device, uh, for my particular app. So my handout here, that's what we're saying. Launch the monitor, uh, skipping down to number six, in the log cat. There's save filters. Right now there's no filters. Show me everything. I only want it to show my app. So we're going to create a new filter here. Click this little plus sign. Filter name. My app. Doesn't matter really. Let me finish my thought here and I'll help you one moment. On the filter name of my app, I only want to filter the particular application. And the name of the application is based on the name that it knows it as its package ID. So under application name, com.jones. template. Clearly, if yours is com.smith.template, you're going to type com.smith.template. I'm typing com.jones because that's what my ID is. Alright, so if you saw my instructions, we're creating here an app name filter, com.jones.template in my case. I'm going to click OK. And now once this once this is um, once once this is selected here, it's only going to give me feedback of this particular app. Notice how this is 5,000 lines of other stuff. So uh, if I do anything on my app here, like let's say I go back home, look at that, it says com.jones has been paused. Well, I'm going to load it up again. Um, what's it called again? Oh, template. Uh, P Q R S template. There we go. Template. So I load it again. Resumed activity. So it's going to be giving me feedback when I when I do stuff, and this doesn't really do anything. So there's not much feedback. 
but if I had something more complex, if I wrote some code in, in Notepad about console log, happy birthday, then it would show up here. This is going to be our new console log where we check our activity, where we check our feedback messages and such. That's what this workflow is talking about here. Your logcat output will now only show feedback from your app. You can now use logcat to monitor JavaScript errors, console.log output. So once we actually put our project in place and start writing more JavaScript and such and making errors, this is where we're going to look to see, oh, okay, error on line 7 of my JavaScript, because it's going to tell you all of that here, because we filtered it. See, it's up to 5,600 lines of feedback, but it's only going to filter it down to this app feedback. If you've got it in all messages, you will see it, but if you've got it under my app and nothing's really there, that's okay if you don't really see anything, because again, this app is not that complex, so you're not going to see much, many results. No. It'll make a... Uh, it, if it doesn't... It really just depends on the project at the moment, so if you see a lot of stuff like this, just uh, not a big deal. Question. Okay, uh, let me help you one moment. Um, here, let's do one more thing, then we'll take a break. In this part of the workflow, it's not very, very detailed, but this will make more sense and be more useful as we go on. Screenshots. When we are ready to publish our app to Google Play or Amazon, we will need a variety of assets to market the app. Screenshots are used to show previews of the app. So we'll be able to take screenshots of our project. Um, from this monitor right here. So I'm in the monitor. I've got my Motorola device and I've got my virtual device. So I'm going to click on the particular device I want to take a screenshot of, Motorola. And then I've got an icon right here of a little camera, screen capture. If you click that, then it pops up here. That's what my screen is currently showing. This is not a live view. This is not a live view, however. If I go back home here, nothing changed there. I have to click Refresh. There's my home screen. So let's say I want to save something. You know, if you click there, nothing happens. It's just, a, it's just a screenshot. Nothing happens. If I go back to my project here, Refresh. Okay, that's what I'm looking at. Then I bring back my project, Refresh. And then I can click up here, Save. And it's going to save a high-quality PNG file. It's going to save this PNG file with the date and the time. It's 2022 already. Done. So I save right there on the desktop, a screenshot. We won't need that just yet. We'll need screenshots later when we actually have a fully functional app and we need to upload screenshots to the app stores for previews, previews of our project. And this will take a screenshot of anything that's on your screen. So right here, I'm, this is my, my screenshot of my regular app, I mean of my, of my device. So you can make screenshots, open them, and edit them in Photoshop, and, and so forth. So this particular handout, then, is, is a bit more theory for the moment, because we don't need screenshots just yet. Our app is very boring. When we get our project all set up, we're going to need screenshots to show off our and market our product. And then this monitor, well, it's maybe not fully useful just yet, because our project is not quite complex. We will be using both a little bit later as time goes on. So that's my second handout. We're going to take one more break, 10 minutes, and then I'm going to give you another, um, another set of handouts, and then we'll proceed. So it's 8.25. We'll do 10 minutes back at 8.35. Let me put in a couple handouts here and turn the printer back on, and we'll go on.